Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Halloween. No, not the 1978 original. No, not the Rob Zombie remake either. Yeah, there you go, the 2018 sequel that has the same exact name as the original for some reason. Although its title is the same, Halloween 2018 is not a reboot, at least not entirely. What it does do is create another new timeline in the Halloween franchise, since this movie is a direct sequel to the original 1978 classic. So in this movie, movie's timeline, there's never been a Jamie Lloyd or a Carrie Tate or a Busta Rhymes or a Sherry Moon Zombie. And perhaps most significantly, Michael Myers and Laurie Strode are no longer related. Wasn't it her brother who like cold-blooded murdered all those teenagers? No. That's just a bit that some people made up to make him feel better, I think. Since remember, that fact didn't come out until Halloween 2 in 1981. That girl, that Strode girl. That's Michael Myers' sister. I think it's entirely understandable that they wanted to wipe the slate clean, because the timelines for this franchise are ridiculous, and it's much easier to just start over from the end of the original. Halloween 2018 is the first sequel since Season of the Witch to have any direct involvement from series co-creator John Carpenter, and in fact the whole movie was billed as a return to form by director David Gordon Green and co-writer Danny McBride. I think they mostly succeeded with that goal. While it may be much flashier and slashier than the now 40-year-old original, it definitely feels more like Carpenter's classic than anything that involved cult curses or Big Brother-style livestreams. In this timeline, Michael's been waiting 40 years to kill again. How many will he secure as a sadistic spry 60-year-old? Let's find out and get to them. The movie begins at the Smith's Grove Sanitarium, where uncomfortable close-ups and excellent sound design create an immediate feeling of unease. A couple of wannabe journalist podcasters, Dana and Aaron, are there to record a story about Michael Myers, and to that end, they meet with Michael's overseer, Dr. Sartain, who sounds like Dr. Loomis in more than one way. Michael has been my life's obsession. In fact, Sartain here was a student of Dr. Loomis, whose shadow still Loomis's large over this franchise nearly a quarter century after Donald Pleasant's his death. Dr. Loomis was the only one to see him in the wild, and he concluded he was nothing more than pure evil. Sartain leads them out to the prison yard, where Michael Myers reigns king of this human chessboard. The little pawns all around him start freaking the fuck out when Aaron tries to reach into Michael's soul and evoke something using his old Bill Shatner mask. He says he got the mask from a friend at the AG's office, which sure, I mean it's just a little murder case evidence, might as well let the amateur podcasters borrow it. No big. Now while the mask they use in this movie isn't for reals the same one they had in 1978, makeup artist Christopher Nelson recreated that mask and added really good looking aging effects to it. I think this movie's mask looks better than most of the ones from throughout the series. <laughs> especially that stupid fucking alien looking one from part 5. In this movie, Michael Myers is played by actor and stunt performer James Jude Courtney, who was a very pleasant dude when I met him at the Halloween convention last year. Fun fact, Courtney was recommended for the role by stunt coordinator Ron Hutchinson, who did stunts on this film as well as the Rob Zombie Halloween. Because everyone in this movie is obsessed with hearing Michael speak for some reason, Aaron yells at the killer in hibernation to say something a few times, his command eventually crescendoing to an intensity that leads leads into a title card. Say something! The opening credits kick a lot of ass, featuring a pumpkin, reverse decomposing, and a chance to cheer in the theater when John Carpenter's name comes up. It's all set to an awesome update on his classic theme, and it ends with a close-up on the jack-o'-lantern's eye and nose. Now can you tell it's Michael holding a knife? So many of you couldn't see it in the original, even after I pointed it out, so maybe that's why they made it a lot more clear this time through. When we come back, we find our intrepid podcasters driving around Haddonfield, Illinois, and recording some shithouse quality audio. Seriously, as I mentioned before in the dare I say fantastic trailer reaction video that Chelsea and I did for this movie, we've used the Tascam DR40 extensively. And if you want to know what it would sound like recording without an external mic like Aaron's doing, then here. This is what it sounds like. It sounds like shit! Aaron and Dana pull up to some private property that's fenced in like a T-Rex pen and has a security camera keeping guard. This is the home of Lori Strode, and the podcasters earn access with the promise of a $3,000 bribe, or speaking fee. Lori's house is a full-on isolation bunker, and it's in this home of floodlights that we get to see the world's most famous final girl again, just after she takes care of all these locks and barriers. We good? Okay, one more. There she is! Hell yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis, it's great to see you again. Lori's not very receptive to these yahoos, who are prying at her personal history so they can get more downloads for their podcast. Through them, we learn that she's twice divorced and currently estranged from her daughter's family. The conversation is obviously very painful for Lori, which makes this whole scene great commentary on how any Jack 
jackass with a task cam can fancy themselves the next serial and go invade communities and personal lives. Lori ain't having it though, and sends these podcasters back to whatever shit town they came from. Let's meet Lori's estranged family that we just heard about. They consist of her daughter Karen, played by Judy Greer, Karen's husband Ray, played by strongest man in the world Toby Huss, and their National Honor Society daughter Allison, played by quote unquote newcomer Andy Matichak. They're introduced to us in a breakfast scene, which is always fun. Remember the Rob Zombie one? Bitch, I will crawl over there and I will skull fuck the shit out of you! Let's see how this family compares. Oh man. I got peanut butter on my penis. Weirdly similar. I guess whether you're white trash or National Honor Society, breakfast is a good time to talk about penises. As we already learned through those prodding podcasters, podcasters, Lori Strode's not on good terms with her daughter's family. Although it sounds like Allison wants to be closer to Graham Graham than her mom Karen will allow. She expresses this frustration to everyone in her social circle. Let's see, we've got her best friend Vicky, who's all about that boba, Vicky's boyfriend Dave, a stoner played by the son of Tim Robbins and Susan Sarandon, who's mischief involves blowing up pumpkins, her bad boy boyfriend Cameron, who's more interested in the next night's Halloween party than meeting Allison's parents at a dinner that night, and Cameron's best friend Oscar, a mini Josh Gad who serves as some solid comic relief. You know, you're just you're two yucky dumpsters and I want to go dive in. Come here. Mwah. While Allison's in class, we get a nod to that scene from the original when Lori glanced out a window to see Michael Myers. But unlike when they alluded to that scene in H2O, with Michelle Williams also seeing Michael when she looked out her classroom window, this time time through, it's Lori herself standing there stalking. This movie does that a lot. It has Lori replacing Michael in new renditions of classic shots. It's a fun way to touch on the theme of Lori and Michael being forever connected, even without the familial relationship. Lori's at the school to pass along that podcaster pay-to-play money to Allison for her National Honors accomplishments. And during their fraught conversation, Lori defends her parenting techniques that wound up causing her to lose custody of her daughter when Karen was 12 years old. If the way I raised your mother means that she hates me, but that she's prepared for the horrors of this world, then I can live with that. Lori is definitely prepared for the horrors of this world, with a home shooting range full of mannequins, and a bunch of guns, including one of those lever action rifles that Ash had in Army of Darkness, and that I previously mistook for a shotgun. Thanks for the correction, you know I'm a gun dummy. Lori takes one of her guns and gently caresses the trigger of it while she sits in a car that night drinking baby bottles of booze. The reason she's such a mess right now is because they're transferring Michael from Smith's Grove to another facility, in a scene that features a voiceover by comedian Colin and Mayhan doing a Loomis impersonation that plays over an illustration of our favorite shape shrink. Meanwhile, our least favorite shape shrink is boarding the bus to accompany his patient. We'll see how that pans out later, but right now, let's get a little taste of Jamie Lee Curtis's famous scream. <laughs> she still got it. At a restaurant, Allison's family is celebrating her academic success and meeting her boyfriend Cameron, whose father is no stranger to Ray. I know Lonnie. I went to high school with him. He used to sell me peyote. Wait, Lonnie? Why does that sound familiar? Hey, Lonnie. Get your ass away from there. Oh shit, that's right! Lonnie was one of the little bastards who bullied Tommy Doyle about the boogeyman and made him crush his pumpkin. In fact, it was Lonnie's friend and fellow bully Richie who was the first person to run into Michael Myers with that cool sound effect. <laughs> Lori crashes the family dinner and chases down all that airplane alcohol with a full glass of red. This is exactly why we don't reach out. Damn, Karen don't fuck around. But you can't really blame her. I mean, who wants their drunk mom crying all over their entrees? Even if it does give this movie a chance to reference Michael's OG nickname. I saw him. The shape. That's cool, but uh, we've got company here for dinner, Grandma. After Allison comforts her vulnerable grandmother, Lori leaves in her giant pickup truck, and in a weirdly flat performance by Judy Greer, Karen recounts her childhood of survival training and reenacting Silence of the Lambs to explain to her daughter why she doesn't want Lori around. I've spent my entire life trying to get over the paranoia and neuroses that she has projected on me. Maybe the monotone is supposed to stem from digging up childhood trauma, but still, seems kinda weird. Speaking of interesting vocal performances, here's this kid. His name is Kevin, and he is not excited about going on a hunting trip with his dad. I enjoy it, but... I'm missing dance class for this. Yeah, also, he sounds like he just spent the first 15 years of his life screaming his lungs out. He and his dad come across the Smith's Grove bus on the side of the road. The inmates wandering around, much like they did in that shot from the original when Loomis and Marion Chambers found them freed from the sanitarium. Kevin's dad gets out to see what's going on while Kevin calls the police. But when his pops doesn't return, Kevin takes his hunting rifle and checks out things for himself. He finds a guard, or cop, or someone on the side of the road and for some reason keeps his gun trained on him like the dude's an 
8-bit duck trying to fly off screen. The guy isn't dead when Kevin finds him, but he seems to have bit the dust by time we cut to a long shot, so I'm fine with having him kick off the count. Our first kill a full 30 minutes into the movie. Kevin approaches the bus looking for his dad, but instead, he just showcases more crappy firearm training. Don't shoot! Ah! <laughs> and then he flees from the scene of the crime? Damn, kid, who raised you? When he climbs back into his truck to get out of there, Michael stops him by rising from the back seat and grabbing him by the neck. You might expect this kid to live because of his age, but nah, son, Michael Myers ain't playing 40 years later, and he kills Kevin by breaking his neck against the car window. Yeah, dude, they killed a kid. Although, to be fair, this series did do that already back in Season of the Witch. Since Kevin managed to call the cops before his untimely demise, Deputy Frank Hawkins shows up on the scene to reveal another couple of bodies to add to the count. We don't need to add this body in the background, cause turns out that's Kevin. Just compare the clothes, it's clearly the same outfit. We can, however, add this cop who Hawkins notices on the side of the road. And before you even start, I don't think it's the same dude that Kevin found. Just compare where the two bodies are. They're on separate sides of the bus. They're also in different positions, and I don't think the cop Kevin found had enough life left in him to crawl that far away from his original spot. We get another body to add to the count when Hawkins finds Kevin's dad up against the side of the bus, his neck so broken that it almost looks like there are some extra vertebrae in there. Ouch! When Hawkins checks the bus for any more bodies, he finds Dr. Sartain, who survived getting shot by Kevin and who tells Hawkins that Michael Myers has escaped. The next day, on Halloween, the podcasting duo heads to the Haddonfield Cemetery to look at Judith Myers' grave, where Aaron describes her death in such detail that it evokes flashbacks to the original. Here we have another great bit of commentary, this time on how some true crime podcasters seem to get off on the morbid descriptions of the victims they're covering. It's kind of unsettling. Oh, and speaking of unsettling, Michael's there in the background watching them all the while. In fact, after they stop at a gas station, where I think Dana says she needs to drop a deuce, she needs to go to number two almost immediately. We see that Michael has followed them there as well, walking around in broad daylight all willy fucking nilly. Dana heads to the bathroom in a shot that makes this gas station look very much like the one in part four, the one connected to that Shrine of Lincoln diner where Doc Loomis encountered Michael again. And after Dana finds a suitable stall for her poop casting, she hears Michael walk into the bathroom, which is evocative of that one scene in Halloween H2O where he stole the keys to a car from that young mom on a toilet. This movie has franchise references all over the damn place. While Dana grows more fearful of the man outside her stall, Aaron peeps in on the gas station clerk and finds that he's been killed on the job, his jaw broken and his teeth ripped out in a gnarly off-screen death. This movie is actually full of those, it's kinda cool. Aaron then heads back to the garage of this gas station and finds a mechanic's body stripped of his clothes. We actually saw this mechanic being killed in the background a minute ago when Dana was asking where the Lou was, but I'll put him on the list now when we know that he's confirmed dead. Back in the bathroom, Michael gives Dana a present. About $35 in tooth fairy bucks. Score! He chases her underneath the stalls in a scene that's equal parts suspenseful and nasty until Aaron rushes into the bathroom to save her. Michael responds by grabbing Aaron and beating him completely senseless, bashing his head against the wall and then the stall door a whole bunch of times. It's very violent, and although we see Aaron clinging to life, the last shot of him does show his eyes closing, so I'm just gonna add him to the list. If he comes back in a sequel, don't bite my head off. This dude's injuries seem pretty damn fatal to me. As for Dana, she gets confirmed killed just off screen, after Michael raises her up by the throat and breaks her neck with a nasty crunch. Oh no, with these two dead, their audience will have to choose to listen to one of the 5,000 other true crime podcasts. What a bummer. With his warm-up kills out of the way, Michael takes his mask out of Aaron and Dana's trunk and suits up to his final evolved form. Mike Myers is back, baby, and he ain't here to be anybody's love guru. After Lori hears about Michael's escape from the prison bus on a news report, she heads over to her daughter Karen's house so she can fire drill her family. Gotcha! <gasps> You're dead. Even though she warns them that Michael's bus crashed, they're more worried about the crazy lady waving a gun around in their house. So Karen ushers her to the door and says, Take a good look at your daughter, Lori, cause it's the last time you're gonna be seeing me for a while. Halloween night comes, and with it, trick-or-treaters, as well as a direct reference to a scene in the original Halloween 2. <laughs> Same costume, same shoulder-mounted radio, and similar abrasive sound cue. That homage leads into my absolute fucking favorite scene in this movie, which contains a few more references to Halloween 2. Remember when Michael kicked off that first sequel by stealing a knife from Mr. and Mrs. Elrod after she asked a very important sandwich question? Harold, you want mayonnaise on your sandwich? How about mustard? 
That scene gets updated in Halloween 2018, after Michael grabs a hammer from a garage and then begins a two and a half minute long one take where the camera never stops rolling. It starts with a housewife, apparently named Gina Pancella, making a sandwich in a very Elrodian kitchen before Michael walks in and murders her off screen. You hear him hit her at least six times with that hammer, and we see the body momentarily after the shot continues on through the kitchen. Michael trades out his hammer for a much more comfortable kitchen knife and then walks through this woman's house, thankfully ignoring the crying baby in the living room. So I guess that's where the line is drawn. Raspy teenager? Okay to kill. Wailing baby? Eh, too much even for Michael. He leaves through her front door and heads down the sidewalk, the camera still following him without a single cut yet. The shot continues as he scares a nurse and doctor couple getting ready to go to a costume party, and then as he steps onto a porch to find another victim with a classic sound cue. With this shot still fucking rolling, y'all, the camera holds its position as we watch Michael go around the side of the house. It's a perfect scene of suspense, and we don't break the tension until we see Michael come into the house and murder this woman, apparently named Andrea Wagner, by stabbing her through the back of the neck. The CG knife admittedly looks a little weird, but if that's what they had to do to assure that one shot went off without a hitch, it's totally worth it. At the high school Halloween party, where a DJ with a badass Frankenstein-themed table blares a not iconic a pop song, Allison and Cameron are having a good time dressed as gender-bent Bonnie and Clyde when she takes a call from Vicky, who's babysitting a little kid named Julian. Vicky wants Allison to come hang out with her, and honestly, Allison, you should do it, just so you can chill with Julian. That kid's hilarious! I know you're talking about smoking weed, don't lie to me. That's against the rules, I'm telling my mom. Obviously, the scene is just here for comic relief, but it fucking works, man. I love the back and forth between Virginia Gardner and Jabral Nantambu, a first-time kid actor who apparently improvised most of his dialogue. If I had some other kind of babysitter, she'd be reading me a story. I wouldn't be up clipping my nasty ass toenail. Plus, they have a real sweet babysitter babysitty relationship. And isn't that what this whole damn franchise was founded on in the first place? Dave shows up at Julian's house, dressed as a farmer and riding a wooden horse named after Laurie Strode's alias in H2O. This is Tate. Yeah. Hi, Tate. He's there to get icky with Vicky, but before they can get sticky, Julian interrupts them, complaining that there's a boogeyman in his closet. Vicky goes to retuck Julian in bed, but when he asks her to make sure the closet door is shut, she has a hard time fulfilling his request. That's because there is indeed a boogeyman inside, and after Michael slashes Vicky to the ground, Julian GTFOs. Vicky awesomely hits Michael with a chair and then tries to be a runaway, but she slips on, what, her socks? That sucks, man. I would have much rather seen her put up more of a fight or have have a proper chase scene. But maybe I'm just being picky about Vicky. Instead, Michael kills her quickly with a couple of kitchen knife stabs to the back, and then shuts the bedroom door. As for stoner Dave, to his credit, even after Julian tells him to run, he grabs a knife and goes to defend his girlfriend. A police report about the incident comes through to Hawkins, and Lori picks it up on a scanner in her truck as well. While Hawkins investigates Julian's house, Lori arrives outside and tells kids wearing the Halloween 3 masks to get out of there and go home. But maybe don't watch any TV commercials when you get there, okay kids? Underneath a sheet ghost, Hawkins finds Vicky's body, and if that seems too decorative for Michael Myers for you, don't forget, he did splay Annie out in front of his sister's tombstone back in the original. He's no Jason or anything, but he's always had a small streak of creativity when it comes to corpse decoration. Outside, Lori sees Hawkins through one window of the house, and then Michael in another, the first time she's seen him in his mask in four decades. For this shot, Michael Myers was played by Nick Castle, the man who originally donned the mask in 1970. He was also a very pleasant dude when I met him in person. Lori shoots at what ends up just being Mirror Myers, so Michael is able to just saunter on out of the house totally unscathed. By time Hawkins goes downstairs after him, Michael is gone, but he does find Dave's body pinned against the wall with a knife through his neck. Again, another pretty decent off-screen kill, and this one's even got a timestamp. Outside, Lori shoots Michael in the shoulder, but he still manages to get away from her. Hawkins catches up with Lori, and they talk to each other in a very familiar way, so at first I had guest, he was one of her ex-husbands. But alas, turns out that's not the case. He is, however, the cop who caught Michael after he was shot off that balcony 40 years ago. In this timeline, after Michael disappeared from the ground, scaring the sanity out of Dr. Loomis, he was apparently captured mere moments later by none other than Frank Hawkins here, who also prevented Dr. Loomis from killing Mikey Mai Mai. The badass-looking Sheriff Barker arrives with the recently awakened Dr. Sartain. But unfortunately, Sheriff Barker's not a bigger character in this movie, and 
and instead we're about to be stuck with Sartain for a little while. Sartain sees Lori and fanboys over her hard. Chill out, dude. You should know Ms. Curtis don't like that kind of shit. After meeting him, she refers to him as the new Loomis, although I personally prefer the much shorter Numis. During all this, Allison's time at the high school dance has been a total disaster, since she caught Cameron kissing with a kitty named Kim. Between that and all the contraband booze he's been guzzling, Allison is totally done with Cameron. But good riddance to him, girl. This dude's the kind of jerk who will toss her phone into some unsanitary party nacho cheese. Fuck that guy. Allison and Oscar leave together, and during their walk home, we run into a spot of awkwardness. Allison, you're the coolest, you're the prettiest, and you're the nicest girl in school. And if anyone doesn't appreciate that, they're a crazy person. Thank you. It's very sweet. Oh no, we have all seen this relationship play out before, and nobody ever seems to win in the end. Hawkins and Numis are out looking for Michael Myers, and during their buddy road trip conversation, we see just how friggin' obsessed Sartain is with the silent serial killer. I want to know what he's feeling. I want to know what pleasure he gets out of killing. Because of that, he wants to capture Michael alive, but Hawkins ain't looking to repeat the same mistake he made in 1978 when he let Michael live. Meanwhile, Lori and a police escort get to Karen's house and tell her that it's me mom bunker time, so they fruitlessly call Allison's submerged cell phone and leave voicemails that call back to classic Lori lines. Now do as I say. But right now, Allison is taking a shortcut home with Oscar, whose crush on her erupts just as awkwardly as we all feared. What are you doing? You deserve better, right? Oh boy, you just hate to see that happen. At least he stops when she tells him no, although he does go into a little too much detail while he's apologizing to her. All these girls are like, dancing on me. Their beautiful bodies got me all chubbed out, Allison. She leaves him in this backyard that has motion sensor lights, and when Michael appears behind Oscar, the horny kid mistakes him for the yard's owner, Mr. Elrod. Which, yes, is a reference to the sandwich couple from Halloween 2. Oscar pours his heart out to the emotionless figure in a bit of backyard therapy. Have you ever really liked a girl and you just couldn't have her? You have no idea, Oscar. We get a very well-constructed scene utilizing the motion sensor lights that keep turning off because of Michael's ever closer stillness, and that builds nicely to a solid jump scare. Oscar makes a run for it, but gets stopped by the gate, so by the time Allison turns around in response to his screaming, it's too late. Michael stabs Oscar in the back, who then falls and gets a spear-tipped fence post through his chin. We get a better look at the nasty carnage after Allison arrives and finds his body. Damn, that's gnarly. The franchise's newest heroine and Michael fucking Myers finally come face to face for the first time ever. And holy shit, there is an amazing piece of music to accompany the seminal moment. Damn, it's great to have Carpenter back as one of the composers, and hear him make new stuff for the series. Just a bit of background, another of the movie's composers was John's son Cody Carpenter, and that awesome noise in this piece was accomplished by running a bow across a guitar, as seen being performed here by the movie's third composer, Daniel Davies, who is the son of Dave Davies and nephew of Ray Davies of the Kinks. Allison runs away and bangs on a neighbor's window for help, and we get a nice reversal of the same situation from the original. Back in that movie, Lori's pleas for help were met with indignation difference, and the neighbor turning off their porch light. But this time around, Allison finds a good Samaritan, who turns their porch light on, and then sits with her as they wait for Hawkins to arrive. Aw, that really warms my heart. Those neighbors were good people. Hawkins is there to take Allison to her grandma's house, where Lori, Karen, and Ray are already waiting. Why Lori's house? Over, say, the police station? Well, because Lori Strode's house is a goddamn fortress. It's even got a hidden stairwell underneath her kitchen island that leads into a bunker full of food and water. Oh, and guns. Lots and lots. Lots of guns. What you trying to do down there, Lori? Open your own Walmart? Hawkins finds Michael walking down the street and plows into him with his police vehicle. And I know what you're thinking. This is one of those Ben Tramer situations of mistaken identity, right? <laughs> <laughs> that never gets old. But no, it turns out this is actually really Michael Myers. For reals. Dr. Sartain tends to him and tells Hawkins that he's dead. But guess what? Sartain's a fucking liar. Because he actually wants to keep Michael alive so bad that he takes out a penknife and stabs Hawkins in the neck with it. Oh damn! Sartain gets Hawkins to the ground as Allison watches helplessly from inside the car. And the crazed doctor kills the deputy with a couple of stabs that leave him bleeding out to death from the neck. R.I.P. Hawkster. When I first saw this movie, I was a 
aghast watching this twist unfold. And my confidence in it was not at all restored when Sartain popped up into Allison's view wearing the Shatner mask. Holy shit, that looks dumb. But thankfully, his game of dress-up only lasts as long as it takes him to load Michael's unconscious body into the back seat with Allison. After all, can't really drive in a mask like that. I've learned to live with the Sartain thing, partly because it's here that Sartain admits to being responsible for the bus crash that freed Michael in the first place. That works for me. But it does still feel like a pretty cheap mechanic to get Michael to Lori's house, since I guess Sartain's gonna take him there for a reunion to, uh, honestly, I don't know, this guy's crazy. And very disrespectful of corpses. The entrance to Lori's property is currently being guarded by officers Francis and Richard, a pair of cops who are another source of comic relief. Once again, it works for me. I find their conversation very natural and hilarious as they talk about what they've packed for dinner. Fresh brownie. Okay. Chocolatey homemade brownie, I made that myself. That's, that's like what a five-year-old would eat if they could make their own lunch. I was actually really surprised to learn that these two actors weren't comedians or UCB improvisers or anything of the sort. Officer Richards there is played by Charlie Benton in his only credited role, since his real job is a special victim's police detective. He served as this movie's law enforcement technical advisor and somehow wound up rocking this very funny role. And Officer Francis there is played by none other than Christopher Nelson, this movie's makeup artist who made Michael's mask and who won the Academy Award Award for makeup effects for his work on Suicide Squad. It was awesome to learn that these two non-actors managed to be really funny, way better than the last time this franchise tried to have a pair of comedic cops. <laughs> All clear. Nothing above, nothing below. Never forget those stupid fucking clown noises. On their way to Lori's, Allison gets Sartain to pull over by saying Michael spoke to her and that she can tell him what he said. Again, since everyone in this movie's obsessed with that shit for some reason, it works, and he pulls over Hawkins' car right down the street from Francis and Richards. Michael reawakens and remasks himself, and then kicks the crap out of Sartain through the police car's caging. As Richards tries to get Hawkins on his radio, Michael pulls the doctor from the vehicle, and Allison takes the opportunity to flee into the woods. From the ground, Sartain stares up at Michael and gives him one final request. Say something. Now, although Chelsea had a great idea for this moment back when we first reviewed this movie. Say, say something. And then Michael, <laughs> it would have been the best 90s movie ever if he was like something and then smashed it. <laughs> In actuality, Michael doesn't say anything. He just squashes Sartain's head like a pumpkin. Yeah, Michael, you earned your patented head tilt with that one. Allison runs away right as Richards and Francis show up. And although they find what remains of Sartain's body, they don't spot Michael as he stands behind them. From inside Lori's house, Ray sees the police car pull up and goes outside to greet the cops. But when he gets to the cruiser, he finds them dead inside instead. These are probably this movie's best off-screen kills, since Richards has Sartain's penknife lodged into his head, and Francis is a full-on jack-o'-lantern. Stick that next to the opening credits, why don't you? Ray barely has time to piss himself before he backs up right into Michael Myers who's waiting for him with a wind chime chain that he uses to garrot the poor patriarch to the ground. It takes a little while, but Michael finishes the job with a quick snap of Ray's neck. Oh man, how are we ever gonna break this to little Pete? Lori hears the commotion and comes downstairs with a gun to see a masked Michael standing on her front lawn. She locks the door and sends Karen into the basement, but after she gets stupidly close against the door, Michael breaks through and almost ends this epic matchup before it even gets started. Lori saves herself and prolongs the headline fight by shooting off a couple of Mikey's fingers with her shotgun, and shooting out her eardrums, right? How's she about to hear anything after that? She heads into the basement with Karen, and they turn on all the floodlights as Michael breaks in through the holes in the front door. Lori tries to wall hack and shoot Michael through the floor he's standing on, but it apparently doesn't hit him, so all she's got now is a hole in her floor in a blown position. She goes upstairs to finish this 40-year-old grudge, and the movie once again makes a nod to the original by having her suspect that Michael's in a closet with wooden slat doors, but she doesn't find him there among the clothes and vacuum cleaner, so instead she methodically checks and clears each room in her house one by one, locking each one behind her with a gate system that she's installed. Meanwhile, Allison has run over a river of blood and through the woods to get to grandmother's house, but when she pops out of the tree line, we end up with a very overwrought scene of her getting scared by mannequins. <laughs> 
Man, I hate this scene. What are they even doing with this? I much prefer my horror mannequins to have a quiet, unsettling presence about them, like they do in a room upstairs in which Lori looks for Michael. After she finds Ray's body, stuffed on a closet shelf like so many Christmas decorations, she does indeed come across Michael, who attacks her for round two of this rivalry. During this fight, he actually manages to stab her and then toss her off the balcony in a reverse situation of the original Halloween's ending. But after Michael gets a good look at her body out there, Allison comes through the front door and calls out for Lori, distracting Michael long enough for Lori to emulate his famous disappearance from the original. Dun dun dun. Allison joins her mother in the bunker, where the two of them hide among the food stocks. But since Lori had shot from down there earlier, Michael knows where they're hiding. So he starts tearing at the kitchen island with his crazy scary strength. While he's huffing and puffing, Karen Strode sees a gun with her name on it. Or her initials at least. So she grabs it and takes a defensive position at the bottom of the stairs. Michael finally breaks the island away, but doesn't show himself immediately. So it's up to Karen to flush him out with a show of tears and fear. I can't do it! I'm sorry, I can't do it! Gotcha. Damn, Karen don't fuck around. And for that matter, neither does Lori. Happy Halloween, Michael. Yeah, like any good showdown, this one's got a third part to it. So Michael Myers and Lori Strode take turns beating on each other one last time. She knocks him down into the bunker and helps Allison escape into the kitchen. But when Karen goes to follow, Michael gets back up and grabs the middle Strode lady. Lori tells her granddaughter to run, but Allison wants to earn her place among the pantheon of kick-ass Strode women. Or as Jamie Lee Curtis calls them, Hallow Women. She grabs a knife off the ground and uses it to stab Michael in the shoulder and slash him in the hand until he lets her mom go. Then it's just one kick to the face and a pull of a lever and Michael Myers is trapped in the basement by some scary spikes. Gas starts pumping into the house and Karen tells Allison that the bunker is actually a trap. Michael is all locked up with nowhere to go, so all he can do is stand there and look up at Lori impassively while she lights a road flare and throws it into the basement. The gas catches fire and Michael still doesn't move, not even as explosions take place and the flames spread all around him. Lori and her lineage leave as her fortress burns down. Mannequins, monitors, Minnie Myers houses and all. But I'm not gonna put Michael Myers on the kill count because as these empty shots of the basement show, we never get to see a body. And you know that fucker always comes back for more. Plus, during the credits, you can hear him breathing, which was also performed by Nick Castle. The movie ends with three generations of kick-ass survivors flagging down a truck and a Texas chainsaw-like shot that pans down to Allison still holding that bloody knife. Freeze frame. How many kills did Michael Myers get in this latest and greatest Halloween sequel? Let's find out and get to the numbers. I counted 18 kills in Halloween 2018, putting it near the middle of this franchise for number of victims. Those victims included only 4 women and 14 dudes, and among those 14 dudes was one kid. So, you know, factor that in however you want to. With a runtime of 106 minutes, that comes out to a kill on average every 5.89 minutes. Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill goes to Dr. Sartain, obviously. That is one messy head crunch. Sorry I can't show it uncensored in the public version, but peep that shit on Patreon if you want. Or just, you know, watch the fucking movie. Doll Machete for lamest kill will go to Ray, both because of the method by which he was killed and the fact that we never get to see his wife or daughter acknowledge his death. Like, come on, at least one line of sadness. That dude was cool. And that's it. Halloween 2018 came out in 2018, obviously, and did so well at the box office that a sequel is already in development. I've got more big request movies for the next few weeks ahead, but until next time, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Matt, aka Fred Allen Bent, Bob Karcher, Chase Joyal, and Chad Brothers. If you're new to the channel because of this video or because of Bird Box, make sure to check out the 10 other Halloween Kill Counts I have. Should be a button somewhere on the screen for them. And I don't know, man, just go watch all the other videos. I got a ton of videos on this channel. Just go fucking watch them. Be good people.